Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Neil Haley Show's Total Celebrity Segment. I'm excited to welcome the program. Pro bodybuilder, natural bodybuilder, world champion. How many times? 21 time world yes, champion, yes. Ron Williams. Ron, thanks for stopping by. And wow, that's amazing to be a world champ that many times. You must have put some effort into that to get to that, to be that, to achieve at the highest level. <laughs> at least a little bit. <laughs> uh, just a little bit oh my gosh so let's kind of go back to the journey did you always want to be this fitness guru growing up no as a matter of fact uh neil i didn't man uh, i had no idea that that was inside of me you know i was born and raised in the ghetto and just didn't have any vision for life just survival man so no vision for life so where what get where did you grow up i grew up in indianapolis indiana and kind of just a very, very poor family. You said you grew up in the ghetto. Yeah, yeah, extremely poor. And yeah, survival was the thing for me. I just wanted to, you know, try to survive from one day to the next. And that's, that's the, the, the point and the challenge, Ron, is just dealing with surviving in life. And when you go through these ups and downs. So when you were at that time point where you were in survival mode, did you ever think you'd be where you are today? Absolutely not. I had no idea that that was inside of me, that I could ever do anything that was worthwhile. You know, um, I was, uh, like I said, born and raised in the ghetto, but I wasn't raised by my parents. I was dropped off at the babysitters uh, and just a really, really rough time, you know, as a, as a youngster, man. Absolutely. So let's kind of, so what kind of turned you around when you were in Growing up, were you a good kid or did you were you mischievous? I was the worst. <laughs> the worst. Oh no. I was the worst. Yeah. Uh, for a lot of years, I was suicidal. When I almost died, I didn't try to kill myself uh, after that, but I just didn't like life. I didn't love my own life, so I didn't care about anybody else's either. How, it wasn't how old were you I, when you were at that rock bottom point? Uh I remember being depressed from the time I was probably three years old, three years old until I was 28. Oh, no. And, and wow. at 13, I was, you know, is when I stopped trying to commit suicide. So what changed? So you said you were dealing with depression to 28, but at 13 years old, how did you kind of get a little bit out of that rut? What did you do? The change the well change two things two things actually happened i had a guy a good friend of mine uh next door neighbor he fell out of a tree and he fell on a rake oh, no. and, it, and the rake hit his head and just penetrated his head and he, this guy didn't die i thought for certain he's gonna die he didn't die but he was deformed so i thought man if i try to do something uh to to take myself out of here i might i may end up just deformed and still have to be exactly here. and it's that much work so when I was 28 years old uh, is when I started my relationship with God. And that's what drastically changed my life. Uh, I was illiterate till I was 28. And wow. I learned how to read. I had learned how to read at 28 because I had to be able to read the Bible, man, if I wanted to know God. And then uh, by 35, I had uh, written a book and became a professor by 40. Okay, so... In that process, in between, <laughs> when did you start? How old were you when you became a bodybuilder? I was 19 years old. 19, okay. years, yeah, 19 years old. I was in the military in Europe. And who introduced you to weights and said you should start working out and really get in, in, in bodybuilding? Well, at that time, I had a, I was on the Army boxing team. And after several fights, you know, we had been running. Uh, 13 miles a day, Neil, and my body got extremely lean. And my boxing coach said to me, have you ever thought about bodybuilding? I said, man, what are you talking about? I haven't lost a fight. I thought he was telling me I was washed up in, in a boxing. Uh, so I went about 200 miles from where I was stationed. I was stationed in Nuremberg. And I went about 200 miles from where I was uh, stationed and competed and did extremely well. Uh, uh, so I from that point on, I quit the other sports and just started doing bodybuilding. And that became my passion, became my family. Okay. It became everything at that point. But at this point, you've not found God. So you still are depressed, even though you're being, yes. you're, 
And did you, you did not attain, when was the first time you attained a world title? Was it after you found God or before? It was before. Mm -hmm. And that's what really led me towards God because I thought, man, if I could win the Mr. Universe, that's what's gonna fill my life. I'm gonna be happy. And I won the Mr. America. Then next thing you know, I'm competing in the Mr. Universe. I win, saddest day of my life. <laughs> what year, what day year of my life. how old were you when you won the Mr. Universe? The first Mr. Universe was in 1988. And how old were you? 19, uh, I think I was 28, 29, somewhere in there. Okay, so wow. So right when you attain the highest level, you're still depressed. And how did you turn to God? So you're at this depressed, you hit the highest level. You achieved, you worked all hard to get to this area. You finally got there and there's still emptiness inside. And you didn't feel good about yourself. What made you turn to God? Well, you know, I'd heard my whole life how God loved me, but all the pain that I went through as a kid, you know, not being with my mother, not being with my father, not having Santa Claus come around, uh, all of the abuse that I went through as a kid, I thought, I believe there's a God, but he must hate me because if he's really God, why didn't he help me through this? So at this point, exactly. um, I'm, I'm utterly depressed and I'm empty. And I win the Mr. Universe. I'm thinking, this is my night. So I win the Mr. Universe, go back to my hotel. People tell me, you know, uh, Neil, they were saying, it just hasn't hit you yet, but you're going to be so happy about exactly. this. I just became more and more depressed, more empty. That's when I, uh, I said, God, if you're really real and you really love me like these people say you do, then change my life. Help me to be different. Yes. And so that's when it, that's when it happened, man. You... You decide to be different and you chose to be different. And there you go. So you only win one Mr. Universe. You got a lot more to win. So what changed when you started working for God and you put God in your life and, and training and all that stuff? Did it <laughs> change you? Did it change how you li lived every day? Kind of tell us that testimonial. Okay. What happened was uh, I competed the following year. I took six months off, Neil, and I fasted and prayed. I did a 40 day water fast uh, because wow. you know, I saw in the Bible, people were fasting. I lost 52 pounds. Oh my gosh. And uh, I decided I'm going to compete again, but this time I'm not going to compete for me. I'm going to compete for God right. and I'm going to, I'm going to help other people. And so within six months, I got back in really, really tip top shape and won the Mr. Universe the next year. But I was just so pleased. One thing I understood with this, Neil, was that I am not Mr. Universe, but I appreciated that God right. allowed me to hold that title of Mr. Universe and that it would be something that would open doors for me to be able to help other people and also to grow myself personally. Because I still had this real narrow mindset right. that hadn't yet, yet branched out into an entrepreneurial mind. We're going to get there for sure in this story. As so you're going through winning them, doing it for God, and you got to be competing for a lot of years to win that many. The people say, are I, you kidding me? Are you? They're probably yeah. like, are you kidding me? You win two or three, fine, but you're not going to just keep winning over and over again. And you did. Yeah, Neil, I'm going to tell you something. People would call me, some of the competitors, they would call me at the bigger competitions and say, uh, when are you going to compete? And I would tell them they were trying to find out because they were not going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> so you choose certain ones to compete in. So you don't do all of them, then, right? There's a big circuit of different events in the bodybuilding. Well, the, How does that Mr. Universe work? How does it, it take place? How many days and how does that work? Yeah. Well, one thing is uh, in order to compete in the Mr. Universe, you have to qualify for it. You have to place in the top two or three okay. in the Mr. America. And then once you place in the top two or three, it qualifies you to be on the U.S. team. And yeah, so. If, so you didn't win. You just wanted to qualify. Your goal was the Mr. Universe always, it sounds like. No, my goal was to win the Mr. Universe. Yeah, every year. And you were, and you did. So yeah. how old were you when you won the 21st? The 21st, I was, how old was I, sweetheart? 40, 45, 46. Oh my gosh, wow. And these guys are half your age, you're beating them. Yes, well, well, this is the thing, Neil. I won the Open, 
the professional and the masters <laughs> all oh in the same. Gosh. Yeah. And they're like, what's going on here? So after you won the 21st, is that when you decided I'm going to change my direction? I've done this. Now it's time. God's leading me to something else. And that's entrepreneurship. Is that where it happened? Well, I, I've, I've, um, entrepreneurship probably started maybe 20, 25 years ago. And okay. it just became bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I started doing ministry. I'm also a pastor of a church. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm a pastor of a church. So it, it, it just became too many irons in the fire. And bodybuilding is a all-consuming uh, sport. It consumes everything. Right. So what year did you start as a pastor and entrepreneur? Uh, it was that after so you did that coinciding with doing the Mr. Universe. Yes, yes, yes. I, I did them both at the same time. But when I started developing physical products, that made it really, really hard because, you know, we have to, we have our inventory coming out of China. And there's just a lot of logistics that goes along with that, that it, uh, it, it actually fragment, you know, I was fragmenting what I was trying to accomplish. So based on natural bodybuilding, did you pave the way to say what you did as an entrepreneur, other guys wanted to start to emulate? Because a lot of those guys don't make a ton of money, right? Just doing the bodybuilding alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're so right about that. You know, you have to do, when you start off in bodybuilding, it has to be for the love of the sport. And in order to get to a certain level, you have to be genetically gifted. If you're not genetically Correct. gifted, there's some things that you can do. It's like um, Michael Jordan. He would not be a great right. bodybuilder, but man, what a basketball player he makes. So much so. Yeah, definitely. So, and that's, you are the Michael Jordan of natural bodybuilding. Is that what people consider you? No, I'll, as, as a matter of fact, I, uh, I compared myself to Michael Jordan once. I had retired for seven years, went into the ministry. Okay. And again, I went on another 40 day fast for seven years. I'm not competing, not even oh my working out very hard. And I remember when the Lord asked me to retire and I retired with alligator tears. I just did not want to retire. Right. So retire. And so here I am behind the pulpit, Neil. I'm preaching the gospel. My gosh. And as I'm preaching, I hear this voice say, you can have it back. And uh, I mean, wow. it was hilarious. It was hilarious. Here I am, this old guy, going to go back into the sport of bodybuilding. I'm standing up in a suit, but I imagine myself with this congregation with my little posing trunks on. Yeah. Uh, preaching. And I start laughing. So they, the, the congregation start laughing. And I, I'm thinking, if they knew what I'm seeing, right. they would know what I'm laughing. So I laugh even harder. But I left that day and I asked God, I said, what was that? And he said, I want you to go back into competition. Oh and I God. said, I don't want to be like Michael Jordan. I don't want to come back and just be good. If I come back, I have to be the best. So I had to design the best program, the best supplements, the best uh, nutrition plan. And man, I came back. Uh, and I was better, at least 20 to 30% better than I've wow. ever been. Did you win? Absolutely. Oh, wow. And then that's the way you walked away. So you won 20 of them, retired, then went back for 21. No, uh, what happened was I had won seven. I had won, uh, I came back and won seven competitions in one year. It was seven, I won seven, I was, was retired for seven years competed seven times. Yeah. Then I took a seven day vacation, seven, seven, seven. <laughs> so during that time you create, you created your own products. So that's really the big entrepreneurship, right? You figured out, I got to be able to make money and I and not just in the sport, but I got to figure out money. That's going to be real lasting money for your legacy. Right? Absolutely. And with that, uh, the ironic thing about this is every product that we've ever created was out of a personal need. Uh -huh. uh, I became the demographic and just so happened other people love what I made and they wanted it also. So then we, right. we, we took it to the market. So what kind of products have you created? Well, a lot of them are fitness products. We have uh, supplements as well as physical products. One product that's, that's gone crazy, man, is a in-home fitness piece of equipment called the Iron Chest Master. Oh, it wow. is amazing. Yeah, uh, it's gone crazy with uh, with sales. Uh, then we have nutritional products, and um, 
yeah, so we just really enjoy doing that. And we also have an online fitness program that we, that we, uh, that we administer as well. And what do you think the big thing you're promoting right now, going out and doing stuff? What is the big thing you're trying to promote right now? Your story, what would you say, Tony? Right now? Or Ron, what are you saying? Yeah. Well, one, the real key with me is we have a, a program that includes Mind Makeover. And the biggest thing for me, Neil, was I had an impoverished mentality, which right. helped me to survive. But in order for me to thrive, it all had to take place between my ears. My body will do nothing unless my mind gives it permission. So I began, what, what happened to me was there's a true transformation that took place. And when I say right. transformation, a lot of people uh, look at that word and they only define it as a change. Okay. The transformation is a change, but it's without the ability to go back. A caterpillar okay. turns into a butterfly. He never crawls again. So I'll never be that same guy that I used to be. I'll never be that depressed guy. I'll never be that guy who thought really, really small because everything exactly. is been broken. Yeah. And you want to teach others that same thing, then, right? Yes. One thing is that it's possible. It's that you don't have to stay in the condition that you're in. If you don't like it, change it. <laughs> exactly. And so how do you kind of go through that whole process of that state of life to say that, like, what is that? Like, what, what do you tell people that are in a rut right now because of COVID and want to try to change their life and get out of what they're currently doing? Well, if, if, as I said, if, if they don't like their life, then uh, there's, there's, there's a mechanism inside of you. Uh, one of those things is what you have to say about yourself. A lot of times we don't realize that how powerful our words really, really are. And our words come from thoughts. Right. And those thoughts are sometimes come from what other people said or what they think about us. But there's an there's a, there's a inner part of me that wants right. to hear what I have to say about me. So say, for instance, if, if, if you say to me, Ron, you're stupid, I yeah. have a lot of respect for you. No, you're not supposed to say right to that, man. <laughs> Ted, so I could, I'm a big guy like you, not built like you, but a former pro wrestler, six foot 10, 300 pounds, but not the muscle I had before. Never like muscle like you, I'm just playing with you. But no, I just, I'm, I'm just answering you. No, you're not. Okay, okay. So, so but that was, that was um, so, so, so you tell me I'm stupid. I respect you a lot. So I embrace those words that you said, and I begin to think that I'm stupid, and I begin to say to myself that I'm stupid. So right, exactly. When people tell you you can't do something, it goes in your insides like you are just like, you know, if people don't yes. believe in you, it's the worst thing in the world. That's and what do you tell That's people right. when they say that? When you know you can, yet they think you're a dreamer, that you can't. Yeah, and I always say this about dreams. Dreams are for those who sleep, but now it's time to wake up, roll your sleeves up, turn that dream into a vision and put some hands and feet to it and bring it to pass. And the only way you can do that is by being focused and have intention. You can't go willy nilly in your, to go after your goals, right? That's right. That's absolutely right, man. That's absolutely How right. do you teach that? So how do you kind of bottle once you figure it out and you figure it out, is there strategies? Are you a very structured person? Are you, do you like have 90 day goals? Do you short-term, long-term explain that to people? Yeah. One thing is we have, we have a program and we do teach it because what, what, one thing I think most people don't realize is when we talk about addictions, we talk about physical things. We talk about things like drugs, alcohol, pornography, sex addiction. Yes. We talk about those things, but we, and, and what makes those addictions, those things, addictions is they release endorphins and we're drawn to those things. But what most people don't understand is we can have addictive thoughts. And those yeah. thoughts can be negative thoughts that actually release endorphins. And we'll fight for those and we'll manipulate, we'll do whatever uh, we need to do. First, we identify the addictive thought process and we begin to go through a 12 uh, step process to help them reverse, which uh, part of that is visualization, it's right. developing your new I am. I mean, it's a long process that we take them through. And man, some of the results we've seen are tremendous. And what I had to do is this was a long process for me. 
I trouble, I began to go through and troubleshoot what I went through and we began to document exactly. it so that we can transfer it to other people. So you really look at your challenges you've gone through and how you overcame them to teach others that when you have those bumps in the road to keep moving forward and, and break through that wall, it sounds like. Neil, I was born for this, man. Every, yeah. every challenge that I ever went through has turned into a blessing so that I could help somebody else. So you kind of look back and say you made a decision a couple of years ago to kind of take a step back for the family or some reason. And then you look three years later and say, why did I? But yet now I'm making that decision to change. Do you, you don't look back, you keep moving forward, right? You want to look at that. If it was a mistake or it was something that was needed, you'll understand more later why that was needed. It sounds like. Well, one thing, the mistakes that I've made, one is I've dealt with, you know, I, I, I uh, some people say, well, your past is your past. Leave it there. But right. The problem with that is if you don't deal with your past, you're moving forward, living in your past. Right. And so what we have to do is face the past, face the demons, as they say, face yes. the demon, close the door, then turn around so you can see your bright future. But your past will track you, man, if you don't. If, if, if you so don't you really want to look at the past so you don't repeat, your history doesn't repeat itself. Absolutely. And Absolutely. looking at, so you draw it out in journals. Ron, what do you do when you look at specific parts of your life and want to make sure that you don't make those mistakes, but you also learn from those things so that you do implement things differently now do you write them well, down as journals that? take notes what do you do absolutely i write them down and then i rewrite it man uh rewrite it the way it's supposed to be so it's you're a journal you like journal writing then it sounds like i really don't but it's necessary <laughs> well you don't like it because you're always going but it's necessary you teach people yes. how important it is to write those things down and absolutely to, and rewrite them so what's the purpose of rewriting? So let's say I take notes and say, okay, I remember this. Like there, there, I was in this one room on Clubhouse about journal writing with a bunch of women. And I was thinking, I don't have time to journal write. Tell us that importance of why. Well, this is, this is the real reason why, because sometimes you have thoughts that float around in your head. If it's not spoken or written right. down, they just continue to float. They're, they're, they're not made concrete. So I'll give you an example. Like I was um, sexually molested as a child. Oh no! And that affected me terribly in the way that I thought. So I go back to that time, those same feelings and same emotions, they also have triggers. So if you were to touch me a certain way, it would take me right back oh, to goodness. that time as if it happened yesterday. So I would go back to that time, rehearse what it felt like, rehearse what I thought, rehearse the person who did that. And then I had to go through a process of completely releasing them and forgiving them and rewriting that story because um, otherwise I get stuck at, as that three-year-old child that was molested. Here I am a grown man and an adult right. still feeling those same feelings and emotions as a three-year-old. So I have to get rid of that. And the only way that I can release that person and get that part of my, out of my life is to completely forgive them. And so I, I, I wrote it down. Some, some of the people that abused me when I was a kid, I actually had to go to them and say, why? And then get an understanding, wow. release them, and move forward. I mean, I had so many, I mean, so many things, Neil, that I had to troubleshoot so that my life could get back on track. I understand why young people go through what they go through. And um, it, it's a type of PTSD. Right. If you were to look it up, it's called HOOD, H-O-O-D, HOOD's disease. And it's a real term that psychologists and psychiatrists use. All right. So to go ahead now, what you're talking, your can people take your course now, Ron? Are they able to? Absolutely. That, where can they go? Well, that that particular course is uh, yourchampionbody.com. And what we do is we want your physical body only to be a reflection of what's taking place inside. So as your inside changes, you also see the outside change that's where transformation takes place. Wow. 
And then your products are available on the website as well, or do you have a different spot where your products are? Yeah, we have um, your champion body uh, website. We have Iron Chest Master, and we also have Ron Williams Ministries.com. So you're busy still doing the pastorship while doing all the other stuff. How do you find time for all of it? Well, one thing is um, the products, those, that's what I do. The ministry, that's who I am. That is who I, I truly love people. And I haven't always been able to say that. I love right. people. and I want to help people and see their lives change, Neil. And so what's your ultimate goal, I guess, is the, the living the legacy, it sounds like. Right, Ron? Living the legacy. That's right. That's right. I want to live the legacy. And um, I listened to one of your podcasts, uh, a couple of your podcasts, actually, with Kevin Sorbo. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I just thought it was pretty awesome, man. Yeah, no, it's interesting. All the different people I get to interview uh, and you're an amazing guy. I definitely like to have a part two, but more of just taking us down a different road, Ron, than just this. You know, there's a lot of your story just we could cover one chapter each lesson of what you can do, but all those different things. So have you jumped on clubhouse to share your story yet? Have you, no. or do you have an iPhone? I do. You need to get on clubhouse and any okay. other people invited you yet? No, no. Clubhouse is amazing. It's but it's, it takes up time, but it's worthwhile and it's inspiring. So definitely uh, great connecting with you and appreciate coming on and everyone needs to check out all your different stuff and inspiring. But I mean, the inspiring thing is you're the Michael Jordan of bodybuilding and wow. I couldn't imagine 21 championships. And this is your fruits, your labor is what we're seeing in your, your own home gym right over here, right? What you're showing. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That the fruits of your labor to have a nice gym like that where you can work out and, and not get COVID, keep training and doing what you need to do. So I appreciate you stopping by, Ron. Thank you so Take much, care. man. God bless you. Appreciate God bless you. you too. Take care. Okay. All right, guys. That was the Neil Haley Show. Take care.